Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hi there. Today I want to address a question someone asked me about the impact of the death of a child on couples' relationships. First thing I want to do is bust this very big myth that we've all heard and people take to be gospel truth. And that myth is that after the death of a child, the divorce rate is somewhere between 80 and 90%. As a matter of fact, I have personal experience with this because after my daughter passed away, a very well-meaning friend reached out to me offering her condolences and happened to make, mention in passing that it's too bad that the divorce rate is around 80 or 90%. And she was hoping I wouldn't fall victim to that. Well, first of all, I want to say that that number is certainly not true. Now, the question is, where did it come from? Well, there was a book that came out in 19, 1997, 1977, I should say, 1977, that's called The Bereaved Parent. It was by a woman named Harriet Schiff. And it was one of the first of its kind when it comes to bereaved parents. It was by a woman who was also in the grief journey. And somehow, and she wasn't a mental health professional, by the way, but somehow she reported in the book that the d divorce rate was, the estimates were as high as 90%. As high as 90% of all bereaved couples are in serious marital difficulty within months after the death of her child was the way it was actually put. Now, she didn't cite her sources and no one's ever been able to substantiate this fact. So it's just something that has persisted since that time at least. Now, what happens is something like that gets reported and then it's referenced by someone else. So there was another article that came out in 1985 that referenced this work. And so people took that to reinforce the work, of course. Now, the thing is, the divorce rate did skyrocket in the, 19, skyrocket in the 1960s. Um, culture was changing. Society was changing. People were no longer staying in bad marriages. So the divorce rate was on the way up. And remember, this book came out in 1977. So there may have been some, some correlation between her, her um, assumption and the uh, increase in divorce rate. But the thing is, subsequent research has shown that the divorce rate among married couples who lose a child is no higher than among the general population. In fact, there have been studies showing the d divorce rate to be around 16%. Another one was around 20%. So I want to say that if you have had a child pass, it doesn't mean your marriage is necessarily in trouble. And it certainly doesn't mean that you're going to get divorced. As a matter of fact, I've actually seen the opposite happen. I've seen people grow closer together after a passing of a child. I can say in the case of myself and my wife, we were very fortunate. And I think that we did. We have grown together because of the death of our child. Because of the way that we approached our grief. We share our grief. We share our beliefs about our grief and the afterlife. Uh, before Shana passed away, I was very, very much into studying the afterlife and all that kind of stuff. My wife, not at all. But after Shana passed, she got into that too. And we actually do it together. Uh, the church that we used to go to after Shana passed, we realized it was no longer serving both of us. So we left that church and we went to a different church and started worshiping together at a place that was more spiritual for us. And then we mutually agreed to leave that place and we don't, we don't go to church at all anymore. But my point is we've navigated this grief thing together. We've been open with each other about our, our feelings. We've shared our discoveries. And so it's been a journey in a sense that has brought us closer together. Now, this I've seen happen with other couples as well, but I've also seen where it can kind of drive the couple apart a little bit. And a lot of times that comes about from us not understanding how the other person grieves. Now, I, I'm going to run into some stereotypes here about men and women. It doesn't have to be men and women, but just say one, one, part, one partner versus another partner. One partner might be more interested in talking about the afterlife, 
talking about their loved one, going to see mediums, going to counseling, getting healing, just really working on it and keeping that the relationship uh, together or alive with the person who's crossed over. The other person might decide to pour themselves into their work. They might, they might avoid, they might not want to talk about the loved one. They might think all the other stuff is woo-woo. This can tend to cause friction between couples. And as sometimes what happens is the person who's not into all the stuff uh, is perceived as not grieving as, as much or not loving the person who passed as much. Even though I think we all grieve, I know we all grieve in our own way, and we have to remember to honor the way the other person grieves. I've had some people say to me, I don't think my spouse grieves as much as I do because I haven't seen them cry or I haven't seen them you know, show signs the way that I do. And I want to remind people that we don't all cry publicly. We don't all grieve publicly. Uh, I cried pretty much every day for years after my daughter passed away. Most of the time, it was when I was by myself. A lot of times, it was in the shower. It's not something that anyone would know unless I happened to tell them. And again, we all process grief in our own way and in our own time. So I think it's important to honor the way your your partner is processing their grief and understand that they are. And again, I I've, I've recall a time I was talking to a mother whose son had passed and her husband was actually walking around in the background as we were doing a session. And she was saying, yeah, he just doesn't, he doesn't grieve him the way that I do, or he doesn't grieve him as much as I do. And again, I was, I was saying there, don't, don't place a, a value, don't place a quantity on his grief because of the way he expresses it. And she was telling me some other behaviors that was going on in their relationship. And I was like, that's his grief coming through in that way. So some people will actually try to stuff their grief. They'll try to distract themselves. I was talking with someone just again, just the other day, uh, a career oriented person. And after their son passed away, uh, they got the advice to pour yourself into your work. That'll take your mind off your grief. So some people try to avoid their grief by pouring themselves into their work. And then again, that can be misperceived as like they're not really grieving where that's a way of them trying to delay it, trying to put it off, trying not to feel the feelings. So what I advise couples is, first of all, respect your partner's grief, however they're grieving. And as much as possible, try to find ways to come together to compromise. Uh, I was talking with a couple, I was talking to the woman and a couple who, after the son passed, the rest of the family didn't want to mention the son's name. They took all his pictures down. It was just like, pretend that that person didn't exist because they didn't want to feel sad. And this person felt very lonely because no one was talking about her son and she really wanted to. So what we said was, why don't we come up with a compromise? Like we set aside a time to talk about, you know, to talk about your son and you guys get together and you talk about it, you know, in a certain amount of time. And I've heard people say, well, if I think about my son or my daughter, if I look at a picture, I'll start crying and I'll never stop. Well, I guarantee you that's not the case. You will stop. We only have a certain number of tears and I guarantee you'll feel better after you do this. So what I also say to people sometimes is if you're having trouble processing your grief, set aside a limited amount of time. Say I'm going to, for a half an hour or an hour, I'm going to sit and look at pictures of my, of my loved one. I'm going to think about them and I'm going to mourn them even. Um, if you're a person that has trouble listening to music again because you're scared you're going to cry, go ahead and put that music on. Give yourself permission to, to feel those feelings. And, you know, when you're having difficulty with your spouse, the way they're processing their grief, go to them and tell them, this is the way I'm processing my grief. I hope that you can honor and respect that. Is there anything I can do to support you in the way that you're processing your grief? And what kind of things might we be able to work on together? Keeping that line of communication open is very key. So again, there are no hard and fast rules. If you do believe that uh, the, the passing of your child is in, in, inevitably going to cause trouble in your relationship, rest assured, it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, as I said, it can be the exact opposite. There's no reason to believe it's going to go that way. And try to work on it together as much as possible, honoring each other's space. So that's it for me for today. I hope that helps and have a wonderful day. I'm excited to announce I have a great new resource. 
It's called GEMS, Four Steps to Move from Grief to Joy. And what it is, it's four things that I've found that I do on a daily basis to help me to navigate my grief. And I'm offering it to you free of charge. It's a free download. Just go to my website, www.grieftogrowth.com slash GEMS, G-E-M-S, and grab it there for free. I hope you enjoy it.